just before 10 a.m. a Saturday night morning, my beeper goes off. And it has this high sound with multiple tones that you can't ignore. The adrenaline is already pumping in my wings as I read the text messages telling me to rush to the delivery unit. Here is the place where I met Lucas for the first time. Lucas is born extremely premature at the gestational age of uh, 23 weeks with a birth weight of 399 grams. As a member of the neonatal team, we do all we can to help and support him during this resuscitation program. To give you a picture of what neonatal care is, the main issue is to open up his lungs. His lungs is more like raisins than grapes. So we need to open his lungs to get in the oxygen and to ventilate him properly. The second major issue is to have a stable circulation, meaning good blood pressure, stable blood pressure, good pulse. We know what we call dips and a good stable oxygenation. We also have to have him pain free as, and spare him from stressors as much as possible. And one major reason for that is that we need to protect his brain. Lucas has a developing brain it's not completely mature yet. And the green dot represents an area which usually is called germinala matrix. And one could say that is the nerve cells factory. And it produces a lot of nerve cells every minute. And then the nerve cells go out in the brain. They connect to each other. They organize they get their job, their assignments, what they shall do for the rest of their life. So we know that the premature infant has a high level of develop and developing process in the brain and it's a very vulnerable brain. The most thing we affair is that Lucas and his fellows get a hemorrhage in, in, in this germinal matrix area. That could affect him later on. So, he is placed in this area after the initial resusc resuscitation. And here he will spend the first four months of his life. And you can see these um, alarm signals that can go off one separately or many at the same time. Different sound, different peaks, different level of annoyance. The characteristics of sound levels surrounding Lucas is there is high level of sounds. We have high peaks. There are both low frequency and high frequency sounds and it's unpredictable. And we have a limitation to control the sound levels, even if we try. The American Academy of Pediatrics, they have stated that the neonatal intensive care unit should have sound environment that are less than 45 decibel. And I don't think many NICUs achieve that recommendation. Lucas was born at the regional hospital in, in Umeå and our reception area is the yellow area. Unfortunately, not all these extremely premature infants are born at the university clinic. They are born in a community hospital without resources for proper care to take care of this infant. 
That means to give those infants a fair chance, as those infants that are born and in, in a neonatal university clinic, we need to get them to our clinic. So specialized transport neonatal teams are mandatory to achieve this. The red um, arrows represent our commonly used flight routes. In some cases we need to fly to Gothenburg or to Lund for uh, reasons that uh, are connected to cardiac, pediatric cardiac surgery that are centralized in Sweden to Gothenburg and Lund. Helicopter is one of our transport vehicles and it creates a huge sound levels. I must wear helmets with air protection and communication system so I can communicate with the pilots, with the helicopter staff and uh, be aware of everything that happens around. But we don't have that kind of facilities for the neonates in the same way. The incubator is a Drager 5400, it's an old one and we have done some studies for many years ago that shows that the incubator can produce higher sound levels inside than outside. Helicopter is a fixed wing. Beach King is, is this example. Is the, aircraft we usually use. And it also produces a high level of sound. Recently we published a study about sound and vibration of sound and vibrations of uh, the effects of sound and vibration on neonates during transport and we could find that if we used air muffs, we call them air muffs, I will show you a picture later on, that uh, when the infant had this the infant also had a more stable and calmer heart rate. But we can also show as the most sickest infants was those who also was the most vulnerable infants. Ground ambulance is the third vehicle we use and uh, they are also creating a lot of sounds. It's hard to, to, to say a special value of the sound levels in an ambulance because it depends on how fast the ambulance goes, what kind of tires the ambulance has, winter conditions, summer conditions, speed conditions. However, we, say we rarely use uh, sirens. We only use sirens when we are going to a hospital to pick up an infant, but then we spend like two, three hours at the hospital to stabilize the infants, and then we can move back in a more peaceful pace. Some of the infants need to be diagnosed because they have no diagnosis, and we need to take a picture of the brain in this MR camera and this is a source of high sound levels. The, re the rad radiologists, they are not in this room but the infant is in this room with not proper hearing protections. They have so small ear ears that it's hard to put in earplugs in those ear channels. Effects of sound is difficult to study in the neonatal unit. It's not much good studies published, but uh, there is a clear indication that the heart rate is decreased if the sound level is high. Increased it should be. Blood pressure could be increased, oxygenation decreased, respirator rate could increase, the frequency of apnea when the infant doesn't breathe at all 
is increased. Sleep defragmentation, less deep sleep is seen. There are only one study, to my knowledge, that have uh, investigated cerebr cerebral blood perfusion and it's not conclusive. Few studies have uh, examined the relationship between high sign levels and intraventricular hemorrhage. So what can we do about this and what can I do to help Lucas in this situation? First of all, we, I need to do everything I can to not create unnecessary sounds. If I have to help him, I don't need to put my equipment on the incubator. Then the incubator will work like a drum. I can shut off some of the alarms for three minutes when I interact with Lucas. I can uh, check the alarm limits. So uh, I have proper alarms. So they don't go off too easily. Speak softly with my colleagues. I can dim the light. There are studies and programs that I show. If you dim the light, you speak even softer. Keep the door to the ward, to the intensive care room closed. Plan Lucas care, cluster care, it also is called that you do uh, a lot of things in a short time and then you leave Lucas uh, alone for a longer time. Air protection, I will show you a picture in the next slide, but first one might think that an incubator protects the infant from, from, from sound, but that is not always the case. And I will show you a, a short movie. And the, it's filmed first outside the incubator, and then I have moved the, uh, the film camera inside the incubator. And the sound level outside is 50, 55 decibel, and inside it is 75. And you will notice when. This is the sound that uh, surround Lucas when he's a little bit older, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. No hearing protection. This is another infant that we have stabilized for transport and you can see the, the air muff. And there is a study and we have also tested that this air muff actually reduce sound by seven decibel. And that's a lot. But it need to be attached to the head exactly tight. There is no... Um, there's no room for, for entries of the si uh, sound in this air muff. If it's not tightened to the head, the sound will reach there anyway. And that is hard to get these air muffs uh, correctly placed. There are studies that have um, uh, study the importance of designing a, a neonatal unit and, and this is our old neonatal unit and um, we have uh, we measured our sound levels at this unit and we uh, had uh, 65 to 70 decibel one major aspect of, of neonatal care is the bounding process between the infant and the mother and to facilitate that and to, to help this bounding process, we practice what we call kangaroo mother care or skin to skin care. That means that the mother should be placed, the infant should be placed on the mother's chest for hours, best case scenario. This is hard to do in, the, in this small room. 
but we succeeded uh, 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 doing that even in these uh, small rooms. But we also, no also noticed that the parents were speaking to each other across the room. So when we got into our new rooms and our new Nikonet, the, um, the sound levels decreased, but the mothers stopped speaking to each other, to each other because they were shielded off, every bed space was shielded off and it was too far. So be, to be able to hear each other, they, were, they needed to shout and they were, was not interested in shouting to each other. We have also uh, followed, the, I have not uh, summarized the, the data yet, but we made a study that of the staff um, experience of sound environments before and after this new, old and new unit. And um, when I checked the data last, I am convinced that the staff is more happy in the new sound environment. They think it's more comfortable. Around the world, we also, uh, there are also studies uh, comparing open bay NICUS. Open bay NICUS is a unit where several infant with several respirators and, and several medical equipment are cared for at the same, same area. And they, then we have this single room NICUS that uh, each infant is in a separate room. And that have shown to decrease sound levels in most cases, not all cases. To, uh, to summarize, this is extremely vulnerable infant in in healthcare is, is usually exposed to the most highest and highest terrible sound levels. And there are few people that do good things to take care of this issue. So if you are lacking ideas what to research about, go to an EQ. You will be fulfilled with ideas. And Lucas made it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Johannes. This has given us an insight into the world very few of us knew hardly anything about. We have a few minutes here, so if there's any questions straight to Johannes, please go ahead. Yeah. Well, it depends on uh, it depends on how sick they are and how much medical equipment they need. But if they don't need so many medical equipments, we we had I think the top was nine infants in that room. <laughs> nearly shouting all the time. But if there are uh, intensive care infants, it could be four. And it's in the new unit, it's maximum four. Yeah. 86, I think it was, 86 square meters. Yes, a lot of difference. Okay, Maria. Yes, I can show this picture. In the general population, permanent hearing impairment, according to the literature, is around 0 .0, 1 po 0 0.1 or 0.2%. But for the, the, the um, NICU graduates, 
those who have been in Inicus, it's a tenfold. I come to add to that that, that hearing Im impairment is not discovered directly after the, they are uh, discharged from the nuclear. It, it can be delayed two or three, four years. And then that, that, that makes it harder to connect it to the NICU sound level. Yes, I think more. Yes, we was. Do you mean our staff or yes. our staff? Yes. Um, the whole unit was. I was in charge for for a group that was was um, uh, uh, coming up with ideas how to design this unit and. Uh, and uh, I can say it, it's not an easy task because on the other end of the table we have these politi pol politicals and, and those who have the, the money and don't, they don't want to spend uh, more money than necessary. So uh, the, the, the only argument that they really listened to it was scientific evidence. But uh, we, f we fought a lot. <laughs> 